Uh, good evening, my name is Tim Worstall and I'm not quite sure whether I should uh, thank you for allowing me to come here or whether you should thank me for turning up. <laughs> and given that I'm an extreme free marketeer, we'll go for the market solution to that. You can make a decision in about 40 minutes time after we finish listening to you. Now, um, the book which I have uh, written, of which you all have a free copy, and we will just do a quick commercial with the camera there to show the people at home what they haven't got for free, they can buy for $6.99 at Amazon, um, is the book called The No Breakfast Fallacy. And the beginning point of the book is that we start with this idea that I'm at a, a radio station, someone called Evan Humphreys is interviewing me very important people speak to the nation on early morning radio for. And I say, well, you know, we have this problem because at the moment there's food in the fridges of the country. It's seven o'clock in the morning, there's breakfast in that fridge. In two hours time, that food will all be eaten. And therefore, everybody's going to die because no breakfast. Now, of course, this is ridiculous. But if I recast the argument and I go on the same radio station and on the same show, and I say, well, good morning, Evan. At the moment, there's 20 years minerals in minerals reserves. And in 20 years' time, we'll have used them all up, and then everybody will die because no minerals. It's the same logical argument. The problem is, if I make the first argument, then people are going to laugh at me. If I make the second argument, they'll give me a big book contract, and if I'm really lucky, I'll become a fellow of the Royal Society. Unfortunately, the logic of this argument is still wrong. Mineral reserves are not what we have available to use. Mineral reserves are much, much closer to the idea of what society has in the fridge ready and prepared to use. Now, in the food industry, we all understand, you know, there's a huge industry way behind our refrigerator. You know, they have pigs that, you know, have sex with each other to create piglets, and then people butcher the piglets at six months and brine it and make bacon. And there's a whole industry devoted to the idea of converting what we might call a resource into that reserve which is sitting in our fridge and available for use. The same is true of the mining industry. It is not mineral reserves that we're all dependent upon. We're dependent upon the whole mining industry which is all these funny men with hammers crawling over mountains and so on, trying to find the next deposit that we are going to prepare in order to make it a mineral reserve, which we then dig up and process, and that becomes the lovely metals that we make all of our shiny, shiny gadgetry out of. We are continually told that we're, society is in imminent danger of running out of minerals. And the point and purpose of this talk, this book, is to point out that that is simply wrong. It isn't true. Anybody who tries to tell you it is true is either lying or an idiot. So, that's the first bit. The no breakfast fallacy. We don't have a problem because tomorrow we don't have enough food in our fridges for breakfast tomorrow and for today. We don't have a problem because mineral reserves are going to run out in 20 or 30 years time, simply because there's a vast industry out there which converts mineral resources into mineral reserves. Now the standard economics of mineral depletion is um, all about the favorite thing of uh, economists, substitutability. And substitutability basically means that you can substitute absolutely anything. And to an economist it does mean anything. Dying of starvation is a substitute for not having enough food. You may not like the substitute that is on offer to you, but it always exists. And the corollary of this is that everything that we do use is already a substitute for something else. So it's simp to an economist, it's just not possible that society will come to an end because we run out of something, because it's always substitutable. Now, in technical terms, we know this is obviously true. I mean, most of us work in the tech industry in some sort of capacity. And we know that there's fiber optic and the copper cabling. And to some extent, you can substitute one for the other. You can use fiber optic for the last mile to the home, or you could use the, uh, and the copper you've saved from the wiring you could use to make the motherboards or the computers to download the cat pictures onto. You know, vital internet services will still be provided whether we are using glass or copper. 
If we run short of copper, if relative prices change between glass and copper, then we will. We will substitute some of the copper that we are using in one, uh, 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 one way, one method of use, and we will use something else to, to replace that. And we can then use our more valuable copper in another manner. Now, as I say, to an economist, absolutely everything is substitutable. There is, there is no possibility that we're going to have a problem of running out of something. Yes, even if we run out of air, dying of, uh, of, of, of not having any oxygen to breathe, this is to an economist a substitute. As I say, you don't have to like what the substitute is, but you do need to understand what the economist is saying, which is that absolutely everything is firstly a substitute for something else, and secondly, by definition, there is always a substitute for it. Now, it might even be that the substitute is we run out of neodymium to make uh, the rare earth magnets that go into your little cute earbuds for your iPhone. OK, so we'll make them out of samarium cobalt instead. Or maybe we'll make them out of aluminium nickel cobalt. Now, the problem with that is if we make them out of alnico, the headphones have to be a bit bigger actually about the size of those Beats ones that the cool kids are buying these days. So, you know, we, we still have headphones, even though we run out of neodymium. So, but that's not convincing. Because in 2007, the Queen went to the economists and said, look, why did the account economy crash? And the economists all looked at each other and said, well, Brenda, we haven't a fucking clue. <laughs> so we're not going to take the economists' um, answer. We're going to reject that. Economists are just panty waste who can't theorize their way out of a wet paper bag. Fine. Great. Let's now talk instead about what the minerals industry says about all of these things. And by doing that, we will still come to the absolute proof that these environmentalists telling us that eco-dammering you know, eco is, is, is nearly upon us because we're going to run out of stuff, they're wrong. They're still wrong. One of the arguments the, the, uh, the environmentalists do make is that we should recycle everything. Okay. Some things are worth recycling. The obvious one in a market economy is if you make a profit by recycling it, then you're doing something good. By definition, a profit is evidence that you have added value. The profit is the fact that your output is worth more than your inputs. And it also means that your inputs, uh, your output is worth more than the alternative uses of those inputs. The fact that you've made a profit is the definition of that. Profits are lovely things. Not quite so much when one guy gets all of the profits, but profit is the value added in society, and consumption has to be, happen from the value that has been added. So the more profits that are made, the more consumption is possible. So, for example, I at one point um, smuggled four lorry loads of uh, Soviet nuclear scrap over the border into Rotterdam, made a very nice profit from doing that, uh, about enough to buy a house. Um, I didn't buy a house, I drank it. You know, <laughs> I, I didn't want to waste it on a house. Um, but, uh, you know, the fact that I'd done this, made $180,000, that was $180,000 of value that had been added to the economy of the world. And someone somewhere around the world was then going to be able to consume that added value. As it happens, it was you know, three guys running a little whiskey distillery on Isla. Um, but, so there's, there's, there's recycling that makes a profit. Um, PJ O'Rourke put this point beautifully. He said, you don't actually see Ferraris in the scrapyard. Because even if they've been totaled, they're worth more than they are a scrap metal. It's the old jalopy that you see in the scrapyard. Things that make a profit will be recycled. And I do quite a lot of work in the Czech Republic at the moment, and there's a, a local mayor near where I work in a town called Most. And the European Union has been telling him, you know, you, you've got to set up a recycling scheme. You know, the whole, everyone in Europe, every town must have a recycling scheme. And he just refuses. He says, why should I spend money on that? And they said, well, you've got to do the recycling. And he said, look, the, the, half this town are gypsies. We have a recycling system. <laughs> and it works very well. Um, we then have a second class of things that we just should not be recycling because they subtract value from our society. 
um, takes uh, concrete. I'm sure that it's possible to take old concrete, fiddle with it, dissolve it, burn it in acids, bake it, something, and create new Portland cement with which you can then go and make the next generation of concrete. But we'd be mad to do that. What you do with old concrete is you chop it up to make the aggregate, which you then mix new Portland cement into to make the next generation of concrete. You don't want to recycle things that subtract value from the society around because that subtraction also means that somebody somewhere cannot consume that value that you've subtracted. You just made the whole entire species poorer by making a loss on doing this. There's a third group of things that, are, that, that, uh, 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 that may or may not or should or should not be recycled. And these are things where we're going to make a loss, but we still want to actually do the recycling for some other reason. Uh, an example is a project I've been involved in in, in America, an old, uh, an old processing plant. There's a whole bunch of waste there. In there is the metal I you know, love and you know, my, my, my household god. I light votive candles to the god of Scandium. And um, it, it, it's a lovely pile of it in there. There's about $90 million worth there. And this waste pile will cost more than $90 million to process. So we're not going to do it. Except this waste pile is radioactive, lots of thorium in it. And the American government, in its wisdom, has decided that having thorium-laden dust blowing around Oklahoma is probably not a good idea. They might be right, you know, just maybe. So this stuff must be reprocessed. When it is being reprocessed, why not take the scandium out and capture that value? It won't pay for the whole process. So the process will lose money, but it's OK, because we think, we're, we think cleaning up the thorium is worth that anyway. So there's that third class of things where we don't make a profit, but there are other external reasons why we might want to recycle it. OK, that's fine. The environmentalists keep telling us, but we have to recycle because we're going to run out of the minerals. That is pretty much the, you know, the pitch. You know, the reason we don't stick stuff into landfill is because we're going to run out. They're wrong. We're not going to run out. This leaves us back with our two things of recycling. One is, if you can make a profit, do recycle it. Yes, super lovely. If you're going to make a loss, don't. But the reason that we're about to run out of minerals as, a, as an external reason to push the unprofitable recycling doesn't work. And that, again, is one of the things this book is about, is at the back, you will see a list of minerals, how long they're going to last under current consumption patterns. And, you know, I mean, some of them, we're going to have to go through two or three cycles of the entire universe collapsing down into the singularity and exploding again before we run out of what's actually available on the crust of this planet. We just don't need to recycle stuff like that. It, 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 it's, it, it's, it's not actually sensible. Now we come to the uh, Chinese rare earth story. This happened in 2010. And it was backed up by all the usual sort of stuff. Uh, you know, actually in the register, we actually had articles of people going, oh no, we're going to run out. And therefore, no more shiny, shiny. And the Jesus mode, you know, is never made again, simply because we don't have the rare earths to be able to make it. Um, now, this is where I actually sort of start polishing my ego and, uh, you know, even doing that white man, middle-aged white man victory dance. Um, because I actually called this right in November 2010. Um, I even published an article in, a, in an American magazine called Foreign Policy. And I can refer people to that and prove that I actually got it right. I called it before it happened. So the Chinese restrict exports of rare earths. Rare earth prices rise. Congressmen are saying, well, we've got to save the you know, ever so important American rare earth industry. Let's spend half a billion dollars on doing this. And, you know, there were other such, uh, other such stories going around. And I pointed out that there's no shortage of rare earths. The two things that you don't know about rare earths, but you should, are one, they are not rare, two, they are not earths. Um, they're actually very, very common. One of them, cerium, is more common than copper in the uh, surface of, uh, in, the, in the lithosphere, in the surface of the earth. We use perhaps 150,000 tons a year of rare earths. There's 15 of them in the lanthanides, two more yttrium and scandium, 17 in total perhaps, 
But all of these together, we use 150,000 tons a year. Um, the uh, mineral reserves of them are uh, 100 million tons. You know, I mean, compared to 150,000 tons a year, 100 million, it, it's a lot. The mineral resources, which is the stuff that we think we know where it is, and we think we can process, is actually one of those numbers that nobody calculates. It actually appears in the books as very large. The total availability, that is what is available in the lith lithosphere, available for our use at some point in the future, is 9,750 billion tons of something we use 150,000 ton 150, tons a year of. Now, I tend to think that that's a problem we can let a later generation deal with. Um, but there was this, you know, everybody was running around worried that the Chinese were, you know, raising the price of rare earths. It was going to run out. And what are we going to do? And I basically pointed out, look, the price of the rare earths has gone up. A couple of companies that are looking for rare earths will get funded as a result of this. They will build their mines. The price will come back down again. And lo and behold, what actually happened six months ago, um, I was able to write a piece for the register pointing out that one of the two companies that got funded, one of them which was Linus Corporation, um, had just filed for bankruptcy and, you know, great. But they were producing 20,000 tons a year of rare earths outside China. So the Chinese problem was over. And the other one that got funded was Molly Corp, and they filed for bankruptcy yesterday. <laughs> <coughs> but the market system worked. There was a shortage. The monopolists, the Chinese, tried to exert their monopoly. What happened? People opened new mines. There's no shortage of rare earths. There's no shortage of rare earth resources, of rare earth reserves. Open a new damn mine. Great. So it works. We know that um, as materials become more expensive, more reserves, more resources, more effort will be devoted to trying to find them, and they will be found, and we won't run out. We are back to our refrigerator. If the price of bacon goes up, then you know the uh, you know more farmers introduce you know nice boar to nice sow, and we get more bacon. Mining works the same way. Prices go up. More hairy men with hammers start cl climbing over more interesting hills, and we end up with more. And um, so I did get to do the victory dance, as you can see, I'm <laughs> a great dancer. Um, now we need to really think in detail of the terms that are, are in use here, the terms of art. A mineral reserve, again, you know, we, 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 we listen to the New Economics Foundation, um, you know, they're also known as Not Economics, frankly, um, or Jeremy Grantham, or, um, you know, the Club of Rome and Limits to Growth and so on, and everybody goes and looks at mineral reserves. How, you know, what's there? And they say, well, yeah, okay, mineral reserves, they're going to run out in a generation, which is about right. You know, Terry Pratchett's idea of a, 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 a generation is a grandfather, 30 years. Roughly the, roughly the period of time from the first time you meet, you know, this, this wonderful person you'd like to spend the rest of your life with, to that great consolation of middle age, holding your first grandchild in your arms. Roughly 30 years, a generation, a grandfather. And yes, mineral reserves will run out in a generation because the best definition of a mineral reserve is these are the minerals we have prepared to use in the next generation. They are not in any way whatsoever the limit of what we have available to us. The mining industry tries to divide things very cleanly, you know, they're like, like most of you, they're engineers, you know, there's, there's things that are yes or no. In mining, it's, the difference is between dirt and ore. Dirt and ore are made of the same thing, things. We only have 92 elements. So everything is some mixture of those 92 elements. We could go to uh, you know, the average suburban garden. Um, obviously, it'd be a rather smaller garden here in London, but you know, those, those of us who are civilized and live outside London will have a little bit more to play with. But it will have you know, helium in it. It'll have everything. There will be all 92 elements in that garden. And the helium might be a few atoms. Uranium, I don't know, ounce, ounce and a half, for in Cornwall, maybe a kilo. <laughs> um, 
And um, there will be interesting, you know, actually usable volumes of iron and aluminium and silicon and so on in that suburban garden. We can extract everything. The reason we don't is because of concentration. And that is the difference to the mining industry. Dirt is something that doesn't have a concentration of anything in it to make it worthwhile trying to extract. Or is something that it's worthwhile processing to extract something from it. But you'll note here that this is an economic distinction. It, you know, it has to be an economic distinction. And it gets, it, gets, it gets worse than that in the sense that we also divide ore into resources, which are, we think that's there, and we think we can process it, and we think that at current technology and at current prices, we can make a profit. It's very, very important that you understand that all of the definitions used in this, all of the terms of art, depend upon profit. They're built into the original assumptions. A mineral reserve is what we have proven that we can make a profit at current prices, at current technology. That's what the differentiation between the two is. It costs a lot of money to prove a resource into a reserve. So, we only actually prove that resource when we're about to dig it up. What's the point of spending you know, a couple hundred million dollars this year if we're not going to dig it up for 40 years? You know, let's, let's let the next grandfather worry about spending that, that, that money on proving the resource. And we can also adopt Donald Rumsfeld's known unknowns idea here. We have known knowns. These are mineral reserves. This is the stuff that we have. We've drilled it and we've lifted a bit and we've run it through a factory. And we know. We know that we can process at a profit at today's technology, today's prices. We have our known unknowns. And these are, yeah, this is pretty much mineral resources. Um, you know, we know that the other side of the hill is pretty much the same as this side of the hill, but we've just not actually bothered to spend all of the money to prove it. So. We, we know that there's more copper over there, but it's not a reserve, it's a resource. It's a known unknown. We also have our unknown knowns, which is things like, I don't know, the Kruzhnihori, which is the ore mountains in English, Erzgebirge in German. It's been mined for 800 years. There's been an awful lot of surveyors who've, who've climbed all over it. And we know, you know, there's tin and scandium and tungsten and tantalum and fluorite and Zinvaldite and lithium and you know there's all sorts of stuff in this in this development. We also know that there are very similar geological developments in other parts of the world. For example, we know that there's an area of the, of the eastern Congo and that rolls over almost as far as Madagascar, which is very very similar in geology. It's, it's an old volcanic plume, uh, magma that was bubbling up out of the ground, but it solidified before the, the top of the volcano blew. And over time, that, that what was a, a column has been laid flat by folding of earth. And we know, in there, we know we're going to have tin and tungsten and tantalum and, and fluorite and so on, because that's where you get them from. But nobody has ever actually gone out and climbed over the central Congo and done the sort of analysis work that would tell us that it was either a mineral resource or a mineral reserve. But we do know that it's there. It's a known unknown. Finally, we should um, be looking at the idea of what actually is here on the planet, because that's our ultimate limitation. How many atoms of copper are on the planet is obviously the limit to how many atoms of copper we can use. Okay, we've got the economists over there talking about substitution, but they're panty waste. We don't worry about them. Um, we can't use more copper than there are atoms. So we think we know roughly what the composition of the lithosphere is. You know, it's sort of 8% you know, iron and 6% aluminium and 7% silicon and blah, 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 down to 0.00001% tellurium. And so we, can, we know what the weight of the lithosphere is. We can calculate what the, what the final numbers are. At the back of the book, you actually have a table where we do that calculation for everything. And of course, that's completely ridiculous. We don't want to mine the entire surface of the planet. But... Imagine that we mined 1% of it. Yeah, that'd be about Australia. Well, all right. I mean, I don't think anybody would notice if we did it in East Siberia. 
So we could, you know, we could mine a 1% of the surface of the planet over thousands of years. And we talk about, again, in the chart at the end of the book, we talk about how many years of current usage of minerals would that allow us to have? And the answer is, as I said earlier, you know, we need to go through a couple of cycles of the universe collapsing down to the singularity and exploding again before we actually reach the, the limits on most of them. Um, I think the shortest period of time that we have left to us is 80 million years for one particular mineral. I think that's something we'll let the future worry about. The New Scientist published a lovely little article back in 2007 where they misunderstood this idea of mineral reserves. They misunderstood it absolutely completely. In 2007, they told us that terbium would run out in 2013. Terbium is the essential agreement of a compact fluorescent light bulb. And when I was walking across London to come here this afternoon, I did. I popped into a supermarket. And they're still selling compact fluorescent light bulbs. We did not run out of terbium in 2013. So something is wrong about what the new scientists said. They also said that we'd run out of hafnium in 2017. Hafnium being, that would be a bit of a shame because IBM's got a really exciting chip technology that uses hafnium oxide. Um, sorry, no, that doesn't make sense. IBM exciting in the same sentence? No. But they got it wrong because they misunderstood that we also have a class of things called byproduct metals. Go back to our definition of a reserve. A reserve means that we can make a profit processing this for that. But there's a number of metals that there are no ores. They just don't produce ores. You know, there, there, there's no concentrations anywhere on the planet of anything that you can process and make a profit. But we still get those metals. There have never been reserves of those metals. There never will be reserves of those metals. But we've had supplies of it. We do currently have supplies of them, and we will in the future. And my, my favorite example up fr up from their list is hafnium. Um, they looked around and they saw that, you know, globally we use about 500 tons a year of hafnium. And they then looked around for reserves, and they found that there were none. There aren't. Except the US Department of Defense had a couple of thousand tons sitting around, and that was their stockpile just in case there was a shooting war. And so they plotted 500 tons a year against this few thousand tons, and suddenly, 10 years later, the world runs out of hafnium, and i.e., we all die because no hafnium, no breakfast again. What they misunderstood is where does hafnium come from? If there are no reserves, it's got to come from somewhere, so where does it come from? What actually happens is that zirconium and hafnium are chemically very, very similar. So similar, we don't care most of the time. So we dig up our zirconium, and the fact that all zirconium is 2 to 4% hafnium. No, I don't know why either. I'm sorry. Just the engineer that God got in to make the world, that's what he did. Um, but it's 2 to 4% hafnium in our zirconium. So we dig up 600,000 tons a year of zirconia, which is the sand. Sorry, zircon, which is the sand. We make zirconia, the oxide, and zirconium, the metal, out of it. Great. All of that contains a little bit of hafnium. However, when we start talking about nuclear alloys, and the big use in nuclear industry for zirconium is to make those tubes that you put the uranium in into your reactor. And we need to have pure zirconium, because zirconium is transparent to neutrons, and hafnium is opaque to neutrons. So if you're trying to get a chain reaction going, you've got to have all the hafnium out of your zirconium. And what you normally do is you put it into the control rods, so if you want to damp down your reaction, you can just put the hafnium back into the reactor, and that's how you control the, the, the chain reaction. But this is where hafnium comes from. We can't go mining for hafnium. But we can extract it, in fact we have to extract it from the zirconium we use for the nuclear industry and therefore we have free hafnium as a result of the existence of nuclear reactors. That's where it comes from, that's where hafnium comes from. So there's about 20,000 tons a year of hafnium in that 600,000 tons a year of zircon that we process. We're using 500 tons a year, 20,000 ton a year potential annual supply, current annual usage, 500 tons. I don't see us running out in 2017. 
And the zirconium resources, by the way, are there, there for, I don't know, another 60, 80,000 years just in the resources. This is without the strange calculation about what's actually in the crust of the Earth. Um, so, new scientists predicted that we were going to run out of these things, and they, they predicted that we were going to run out of them on the basis that they simply didn't have a single clue about the industry they were talking about. This is purblind ignorance. And yet this is now actually uh, an essay which is distributed to schools as part of um, you know, educating people about the planet and the environment. Well done, our civilization. You know. <laughs> Promulgating complete and utter stupidity. I'm sorry, that's the, I, I can't think of anything else to, to call it. We then come on to Jeremy Grantham, who has made another interesting mistake. Jeremy Grantham is a very wealthy, self-made wealthy financier. And he really should not be making this mistake. Um, in his, um, in his uh, not old age, uh, in the richness of his maturity, um, he has decided to pick up um, environmental matters. He funds uh, Nick Stern's centre, the Grantham Centre at the London School of Economics, for example. You know, again, another story about, i.e., we're all going to die because, uh, what is it, the oceans boil? Um, we end up barbecuing flipper on the last ice flow, something, something <laughs> like that. Um, but he, um, his particular worry is that um, potassium and phosphorus are going to run out. Now, the minerals for these are phosphate rock and potash, but it's potassium and phosphorus are the two important ones, and they go into fertilizers. Modern fertilizers have to have them. And, yeah, it would be pretty important. You know, I mean, if, if we were going to run out of those and there's 7 billion people on the planet and you can't feed 7 billion people from organic agriculture and, yes, many, you know, it really would be, i.e., we all die if we were going to run out of these. One thing that I find interesting is that the average mineral reserve of all, you know, minerals is about 25, 30 years. Grantham has chosen to get worried about the ones that have 60-year reserves. I don't know. Hey, he's a rich old man. He can do what he likes. However, he published something in uh, Nature about this, a commentary, and I wrote um, uh, a letter to Nature. No, sorry, that's not right. A letter to Nature is the important one, isn't it? You know, dear sirs, I have discovered the secret of life. It is the double helix. A letter in Nature is the one that says, uh, dear sirs, your previous correspondent is a fool, right? I managed the second, the, the letter in Nature. I, don't, I will not be able to ever manage the letter to Nature. Um, well, sorry, no, not while civilization still retains any sort of um, intelligence, I won't. So I wrote and, and pointed out that, um, you know, he was wrong. Um, the resources of our two minerals, phosphorus and potassium, are 1,500 years for one of them and 7,500 years for the second of them. And our total resources, well, one of them makes up 0.2% of the entire lithosphere. The other one makes up 2.5% of the entire lith lithosphere. We are simply not going to run out of either of these two minerals any time between now and the heat death of the universe. It's just not going to happen. But I was referred to some other writing of Grantham's where he sort of admitted, OK, resources can be converted to reserves, so it's not as bad as I paint it. But our problem is that nobody is doing this converting, and in 60 years' time, we'll have a problem. Right. Now, OK, somebody who doesn't understand money, fair enough. You know, money has a time value. Why spend something today when you could stick it in the bank, earn interest, and then spend the money 50 years in the future when you actually need to spend it, and you can keep all the 50 years of interest, the time value of money? But it's really strange to find a financier who has made hundreds of millions of dollars of his own money not getting the time value of money argument. Now, just to show you how expensive it can be to move a resource into a reserve, I know a mining company called Sherritt. Now, they're uh, nickel cobalt miners. Fun company, actually. They do the, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, all right, sorry, mining fun. Uh, yeah, I know. Um, they, uh, they do the extraction of the nickel um, in Cuba. 
uh, it's one of the big hard currency uh, you know, lifelines for the Castro regime. And obviously these mines were, were stolen, sorry, um, appropriated um, uh, at the time of the revolution without compensation. This means that the product of the, this mine falls under the Helms-Burton Act, which means that if it ever goes into the United States, then the American government gets to confiscate it. So, Sherritt being a Canadian company, that's fine. They take the Cuban um, nickel oxide and they process it into nickel in Canada. They have a contract with the Canadian Mint. And the Canadian, the, the Cuban nickel ends up in some Canadian coinage. Which means, in theory, that anybody walking across the American border with a nickel or quarter in Canadian cash should have it confiscated by the American federal government. It, it doesn't actually happen, they don't, they don't go that far, but uh, you know, the Canadian coins and American coins circulate on either side of the border one to one, you know, they're, they're, they're fine with it. But I think that does show us that there's at least one person in the Canadian mint who has a slightly puckish sense of humour. So, Sherrick opens a new nickel cobalt mine in Madagascar. And it's a slightly new mineral, what's called a nickel laterite, and nobody's quite sure whether the processing plant is going to work but they're going to give it a good, good old try, you know, the good old Canadian try. And um, they spent $4 billion. That's the last number I saw about 18 months ago. And they were producing nickel from this nickel laterite. So real nickel, you know, people, people were making coins out of it, you know, coins that weren't being confiscated as they crossed the Canadian border. And yet the nickel deposit, the ore, the dirt, we might say, was not listed as a mineral reserve because they were losing money on this new process. It can only be a reserve if we're making a profit out of processing it. They were losing money on their $4 billion investment. This is not a mineral reserve. So this answers Grantham's question quite nicely. For example, there's a, um, a mining company called Sirius trying to mine potash up in um, North Yorkshire Moors Park, I think it is. They spent a couple hundred million on you know, designing how they do it. It's not a mineral reserve because we haven't proven that it is profitable to extract that material. So why would anybody actually spend a few billion dollars on converting a resource into a reserve if we're not going to mine it for another 60 years. Grantham should understand this as a financier. He doesn't. Bit of a problem, really. Um, the, basic, the, 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 the basic idea here is that um, we just don't have a shortage of mineral resources. And if we don't have a shortage of resources, we can't have a shortage of reserves. That's just a purely an engineering function that we transfer one to the other by spending a bit of time, money, and attention on it. At which point in the explanation, there's usually somebody who says, yeah, but what about energy? Because obviously, you know, we are going to um, be mining lower grade ores, stuff closer to dirt in the future. It will require more energy. It'll cost more. It'll be less useful. There will be less profit. There will be less value added. You know, it will be a poorer society in the future. And this is one of these things that could, in fact, be true. You know, logically, it, it could be true. As it turns out, it isn't. Um, just one example of, of this. We all know that Cornwall is where all the tin mines were. Cornwall was hard rock mining. You have to actually go and drill into hard rock to get your ore out. The thing that really killed the Cornish mining industry was the discovery in Indonesia that um, the big rivers of you know, the Mekong and, and, and so on had ground down the mountains which contained the tin ore over millennia, not just millennia, millions of years. And this tin ore is now sitting on the bottom of the rivers. And there's a couple of islands, uh, Banka and Belitung, where, where most of the Indonesian tin industry is now. And you can actually go swimming with a snorkel and you can see a stripe going through the sand underneath you. And this is tin ore, which has been sorted by the water over the generations. It's been ground out of the mountain and sorted. And actually, 
Um, I've actually I've seen a video which was wonderful. This guy mounted a, a vacuum cleaner on a little balsa wood raft and started sucking up the tin ore, and he was able to take it to the tin refinery. Now that's obviously easier than getting 50 Cornishmen to start hacking away at a mountain. It's also lower energy. So it's not true that we, we will inevitably be moving to higher energy requirement deposits. And the reason really is that we didn't go out and survey the whole world before we started. You know, there's the, the actual knowledge of exactly what minerals are where is tiny. I mean, we, 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 we know roughly what the composition of the earth is. We know that there's millions and millions of tons of this and that and the other roughly in these various places. But absolutely nobody has actually gone out and surveyed the whole world and then decided we'll take the cheap stuff first and we'll let the later generations deal with the expensive stuff. It just isn't true. So there really isn't actually any limitation in mineral resources. And this is, this is the point of, 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 of the book, of, of, of this lecture, of um, the whole thing I've been trying to do for these, uh, these past couple of months is to point out there may well be environmental problems out there. I can imagine environmental problems from the use of some of these metals. You know, potassium and, and um, uh, phosphorus specifically, too much on the fields will produce algal blooms in the runoff in the rivers. That's a problem. Uh, we have this problem of climate change. Yeah, that's a problem. We have all sorts of environmental problems. But the one problem we don't have is running out of minerals. It's just not going to be a problem that happens to this species in any time span that we actually give a damn about. Which brings, finally, to the Club of Rome and their book, Limit, their, their report, Limits to Growth. And they disagree with me. And they're much more richer, more famous, have more money to do research. They're older. They must be right. Because they quite famously said back in 1972, right about now, civilization should be falling apart because we're starting to run out of minerals. They were wrong. I mean, okay, Simon Cowell exists, so therefore civilization is falling apart, but not because of mineral shortages. What did they get wrong? Now, because I'm a nice guy, I'll be fair. They did get one thing a little bit more sophisticated in the way I've done it. I've used straight line um, predictions. You know, if, if the world used 500 tons of hafnium last year, it's going to use 500 tons next year. They just looked at, they looked at you know, population pressures. So if the population goes up 10%, then the world will use 550 tons next year. They also looked at the rate at which different minerals are growing or falling in usage um, to try and make their predictions. Now, the population one, we don't really have to worry about. You know, the latest population predictions are peak, peak humanity at 9 billion in 20, 25 years' time, and then declining thereafter. Now, that's the UN telling us. Um, the idea of um, predicting future mineral consumption from past is a little bit more difficult on the basis that um, America, for example, uses less copper per head than it did 30 years ago. Uses less iron per head than it did 30 years ago. Because it appears that you get to a certain level of civilization, and so we're going to build version 4. Or is it 4.0 for, for computing people? You know, the, um, the one that you never buy, the, the point zero version of an operating system. Um, <laughs> But you, you, you know, it turns out that when you build version 4.0 of a society, you've got an awful lot of stuff left over from version 3.0 that you can recycle. So your demand for the virgin minerals actually declines as the society becomes richer. This obviously isn't true at the moment of China. They're sucking in vast amounts. I mean, one number is that they're producing and consuming more steel in China alone than the rest of the planet put together every year. And you can see this, really. I mean, you know, America, no one is, you know, we, we pretty much hit peak car in America. You know, the, 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 the American car market is a replacement car market. 
you know, for every tonne and a half of steel of new car that gets driven on the road, there's another tonne and a half of steel coming off the road in an end-of-life vehicle. In China, where, you know, only three people and, and, and the odd, you know, the, the, you know, three people had cars in 1978, and we predict in 2050 that, you know, all 1.3 billion of them will, we're, they're obviously ramping up the stock of iron and steel that is in their car population. So that's a big chunk of what, you know, current demand is. But again, they're going to reach peak car and it'll be fed by recycling. So the Club of Rome's um, ideas of dynamic estimation aren't quite as valid as they seem to think they, they were. However, apart from all of that, they made one very serious mistake right at the beginning. They made an assumption. That assumption bakes in to everything else that they do the fact that, oh my God, we're all going to die because no minerals. And that assumption was mineral resources are 10 times mineral reserves. Mineral reserves are what we've prepared to use in the next 20, 30 years. If you then assume that mineral resources are only 10 times that, then of course society falls apart in 300 years. And that's it. That's what they did. That's the whole basic assumption that they've got about mineral availability. Nothing else. Don't forget, once you've made that assumption, there is no opportunity for you to say society's going to be okay. You know, you, you've, you've baked into your original assumptions that society dies in 300 years' time. They were wrong. And that really is um, where I leave it, because um, I keep telling you that other people are wrong, and most of you won't believe me, <laughs> which is terribly sad, even though I am right. <laughs> and there's a whole book. And at the back, we need, a, we need a little commercial break for the people at home to point out that you too can, in fact, read that book at only $6.99 at Amazon. Even if you don't believe it. But, as I said, right at the beginning, the whole point and purpose of what I've been working on these, the, you know, the, the recently is trying to examine this idea that we're about to run out of mineral resources. Now, given that I have a background in economics and I also have a background in the metals trade, I'm one of the very few people that has both backgrounds, I seem like the right sort of guy to actually try and do that investigation. And the result of the investigation is, I'm sorry, but they're wrong. And I am right. <laughs> and I get to do the middle-aged man victory dance. <laughs>